Yes, sorry. Um, the, could, if, if we took your uh, second explanation for the evolution of art as, 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 as true, um, <coughs> that maybe there's something useful in, uh, to see, say, you know, sticking a spear, you know, pointing a spear at an ox, um, that, that maybe there's something about Kincaid you know, that is, 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 touches something in the brain um, that, uh, that, say, excites some neurons that say, oh, this is a light in the forest and I feel like I'm home. You know, it's a pastoral scene or something like that, and there's something primitive, you know, that, 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 that it's addressing. Well, now, how is that different from, say, seeing this Rodin sculpture, which has a certain sensuality to it, and seeing, say, a Ferrari Tuscarossa, which has a certain set of sensuality to it. And now, if you have 100,000 Ferrari Tuscarossas in the city, not just in La Jolla, but everywhere, would that turn it into peach? Would it still be sensual? Would it still make neurological sense? Would it still be art? You know, do, does the tingling that we get from seeing, uh, say, Picasso. Now, I, when you when you put the the, 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 the painting of the sky, and the, you know, I don't remember, I don't know the name of that piece, but it was tan and blue and beautiful clouds and you know, so on. Um, I can see that's great art according to the conventions of art and capability, you know, skill, you know, it, it's truly great work. But it doesn't give me the tingling that certain other kinds of things do. So, what's going on such that? something that might meet all the conventions, might meet all eight, eight of your criteria, and yet nevertheless doesn't address what's going on, you know. Uh, go ahead. So, I'll, 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 well, my, my, my explanation there is, 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 is cliche, is what the thing, what the op operation is, is when something becomes commonplace or very, very, you know, what you see all the time, it may, ha it may look in many ways uh, the same as something that's basically not a cliche, and it's, uh, so I think we just become uh, immune to it. it is sort of we actually despise it if it's too uh, too cliche, and that, that's I think what Kitsch does. So if Kim K made but one painting, would he? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it doesn't matter how how. How prolific or ubiquitous it is, but the, the idea of that painting, that style, is cliche. No matter who does it, whether it's Kincaid or, or, uh, and he only did one or, however many. So, picking up on that, what I would say is, you take these universal laws of art, and if you have a superficial idea about them, and you deploy them superficially, go through the motions without a real gut level understanding of what they're about. Then you get cliché and you get this kind of Kincaid. And uh, the tingling you get from Kincaid is a different kind of tingling. It's kind of <laughs> slightly, I don't know how to say it, but We're nauseating. I'm sorry, what was that? Do you play the piano or do you like to paint? Uh, I like to sketch, but I don't paint or not all play the piano. I like to listen to it, but I don't play it. I'm very limited in my creativity. Did you have a question? There was a book that uh, came out two years ago called Proust was a Neuroscientist. And it talks about some 19th, 20th century artists, writers, painters, uh, Proust, and shows how their artistic ideas sort of present the neurological ideas that we now have today. So that might be a little bit of an answer to your question. Another question? Yeah, it seems like we've spent most of the evening trying to define art from a scientific point of view, both with language and uh, in terms of biological and psychological phenomena. It seems to me since we all agree that art has been around for 30,000 years, I guess, and science has been around for what, 2,000 at the most? Yeah, okay. So maybe I'd like to talk about how artists, I think in a lot of your work, Roman, that you're, you're really defining science with your, with your visual work. Because with the way the different connections are, 
And uh, I'd like to know, one, you know, if there's any instances where you think of art the way art defines science, and then from the scientist, what, you know, if, if we've been spending the evening talking about what is art, maybe we should talk about, at least have some of sort of definition of what is science. Mm -hmm. well, well, if I can comment, I think one of the first pieces of something was some cave, caveman-ish people, 70, person 70,000 or 100,000 years ago, after he chipped a uh, rock that worked perfectly as a tool, uh, perhaps put a notch on it to identify as, that's mine. Now, that's sort of the science of, he's, he figured out how to chip rocks to get the right angle. Uh, but is that mark art on that? And if someone says, well, that's nice, I'll put an X for my, for my uh, tool. <laughs> consumer of scientific innovation and uh, just it, it, it interests me uh, and I've, I've never uh, I, I think I have some understanding of scientific method but I also can see that that doesn't have to be entirely formalized uh, that people can kind of do research just in the kitchen making you know Making a cake, try it different next time. After you, the, your findings was you, you, you didn't like the first one as much as the, the second one. There's this, there's some sort, some sort of science going on in that, and I suppose um, my approach as an artist is kind of a <coughs> research oriented in that way. Uh, though I really would make no claims to having any kinship as much as an appreciation for an interest in, in science. Case. Let's take one more question. And, uh, but, uh, visual uh, or aesthetic appreciation is something. I wonder um, though about the sort of synesthetic qualities of the senses. And even when we see something, uh, say a certain stone or something, we immediately already have a kind of qualitative sense of its texture and or of something else in that but when we talk about something, you know, when we appreciate something visually, how do you account for the, the feel? I mean, you feel music in a certain way. But you don't mean it as in like, well, it comes into my ear and then basically a bunch of neurons fire and I have a great experience. You feel it as a sort of unified, uh, qualitative feel about the experience. So I, I guess the question is, do we create like laws or rules or universals that are based on one sense? Um, do we, are we not accounting for the synesthetic quality that is actually already sort of background? Well, the, uh, the rules are not exhaustive. What is the other principles? And synesthesia is something we've been studying extensively for the last five years. And I don't mean in, in, in a pure sense of synesthesia. Yeah, no, I know you mean intersensory harmony. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, there are parts of the brain which are involved in that. For example, the left, uh, not just the left, the, 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 the structure called the uh, inferior parietal lobule. It's involved in mingling of the sensory system. So if there's a sound, sound here, and you visually see me clicking my fingers here, the congruence of the sound and the click is established by the inferior parietal lobule. So this sort of intersensory harmony is pleasing to the brain because, for, for obvious reasons. You know. So, so the laws I'm talking about don't necessarily negate the importance of intersensory harmony. Synesthesia is actually a different phenomenon. We use the term specifically where a person hears a tone and sees a particular color. But in a more general sense, obviously, it's evolutionally useful to harmonize the different sensory systems. Well, I want to thank you all. We'll, we'll, there'll be a few minutes here.